60 Minutes Overtime. We now have patients with pancreatic cancer that are free of metastasis for five years. How many people know of that? That's Dr. Patrick Soon Shang. This week on 60 Minutes, Dr. Sanjay Gupta profiles the renowned doctor and entrepreneur who's shaking up the cancer world with a revolutionary approach to treatment. Dr. Soon Shang, also known as Dr. Pat, is not just the wealthiest man in Los Angeles, he's a partial owner of the Lakers. Good seeing you. And a familiar face in the team's training room. Is, is Dr. Pat good luck for you when he's here? Yeah, we have, we have our, our routine that we do um, every game. If you watch Lakers games, uh, Kobe Bryant gives a hug to one guy before the game actually starts. That's our guy. Seems to be working pretty well. Well, it is. <laughs> Three more to go. Yeah. <laughs> You're talking about a city that thrives on celebrity and status and He's neither. Unless, he's neither. You know, most people have no idea. They think it's somebody involved in the entertainment industry or, you know, a movie producer or, you know, even an actor. And it's uh, Dr. Patrick Soon Shong. Yes, you got there. See you soon. I'm Dragan Mahalovic, and I'm the producer of the story Disrupting Cancer. I think uh, Dr. Soon Shong is one of these guys who is probably used to having been the smartest guy in the room probably from a very young age. You may want to see this video again because I, I'll, I'll describe it to you. So. One of the biggest challenges for Gupta and Mahalovich This is really important, this whole sequence. Can we get this tight? was how to best give viewers a sense of what goes on in the mind of a medical genius. How does the Braxton work? How does the Braxton work? They began by asking him about his groundbreaking cancer drug, Abraxane. But if you have a cell, and this, let's say, the innards of the cancer cell, there was a whiteboard there. He takes a marker and he starts, you know, as you saw at the beginning of the piece, and off he went. And this goes on for 45 minutes. I mean, it was just like, it was as if you, your kid took like a bowl of spaghetti and like threw it up against a white wall. It was this idea that cancer patients lose weight. But why do they lose weight? Even if they ate the same number of calories or even double the calories that they used to eat, they could still be losing weight. Why? What Dr. Patrick Sun Shang was sort of thinking about was it's the protein in the blood that is just sucked up by these cancers. Mm. So if the cancers love protein so much, here's an idea. Let's stick the chemotherapy in the protein. And the protein's now a Trojan horse around the chemo. So the cancer is happy, it's being fed, it's getting all this protein, boom. Chemo goes off in the tumor, and all of a sudden, you got a very, very effective, potentially, therapy. We have it approved in breast cancer, we have it approved in lung cancer, and we're talking about patients in pancreatic cancer and melanoma. That's Dr. Patrick's mind. So Dr. Soon Shang believes that the conventional approach to classifying screen. cancer according to its location in the body is short-sighted. He says it's the mutation of the gene, what made it go haywire, that matters. We need to reclassify cancers now to its molecular fingerprints. He's not just thinking out of the box. I mean, he's creating a revolution. He, he's absolutely creating a revolution and it, it involves so many different facets that are not just medicine. Quick example, when you're talking about sequencing genomes of many, many patients uh, around the United States and around the world, that is a lot, a lot of data. You're talking about six billion pieces of information for each patient. Right now we move things through the information superhighway at about uh, megabytes per second. He's talking about wanting to do that in petabytes per second. Never heard of that. You got megabytes, a thousand megabytes is a gigabyte, a thousand gigabytes is a terabyte, a thousand terabytes is a petabyte. So you're talking, you know, exponentially more data per second. And he's basically figured out ways and funded ways to make that happen. That's part of what a revolution looks like. The story will continue after this. Here we have the world's fastest video camera. What we've done is to take the power of optics or the sun and created a rainbow from laser light. He's involved in the technology. He's involved in immunotherapy. So you're literally watching cancer cells die here. Correct. He's involved in circulating tumor cells. You know, he's involved in metastatic uh, cancers. He's, you know, still involved in some respect with his original drug, Abraxane, and how that's used in combination therapies. And the brain is always working with Patrick. I is there anything like this right now? I mean, is anyone doing this sort of? No, it's in our lab. <laughs> this is what we call the clinical translational world where 21st century exists today. He comes across as incredibly confident. And if one has cancer, is he the only game in town? I don't think Dr. Pat 
is the only game in town by any means. I think he's he's someone who is looking at trying to disrupt the, the whole system. I think there are a lot of great oncologists out there, and frankly, there are a lot of oncologists who not only believe what he's doing is the right thing to do, but they're doing it themselves. They're doing it, but just at smaller scales. Patrick's sort of belief is, look, I already think that this is this is what's going to work. He's screaming this it from the rooftops. Screaming it from the rooftops, spending his own money. Well, I haven't really counted, but it's close to a billion dollars. A billion dollars? A billion dollars. Where's the government in all this? Trust me, we tried, um, you know, since 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011. I was in Washington. I was at the White House. I was at Congress. I was um, everywhere. We have not received one penny of funding. Is he an easily accessible physician? There were times when I'd be riding along with him his phone would ring and it would be somebody who, who had been sort of referred to him by somebody, you know, one of those situations and he'd be on the phone with them for 15, 20 minutes, here's what I think you need to do. For the hundreds of thousands of people on chemotherapy, Dr. Sun Shang is not saying mm -hmm. stop what you're doing, cool. but he's pretty much on the edge of that. What he's saying is ask questions. You know, is this the right thing to do? Because more and more what uh, scientists and oncologists will tell you is that perhaps in some cancers, and I'm going to qualify this, in some cancers, a heavy blast of chemotherapy may not necessarily be, you know, the long-term answer. I, uh, I'm, del I'm delighted to, to, to be here. I, I care deeply about uh, so many of the things that uh, you, you all care about, and I'm particularly delighted to, to be able to moderate this next panel. You know, when we do stories uh, for, for 60 Minutes or for CNN, there are several ingredients that we want. Um, but some of the big ones are that we want something that's going to really uh, capture people's imagination, sort of a, a gee whiz, if you will, aspect to the story. Uh, we want stories that are going to have tremendous impact on large numbers of people. And it's something that we sit around a lot with our, with our producers and our editors and, and try and figure out what are those stories. But I think uh, perhaps one of the most crucial ingredients is, um, is the, the characters, the characters of our stories, the storytellers that really navigate us through some, at times, complicated concepts. Um, it, about two years ago, uh, two and a half years ago, I met Dr. Pat, Dr. Pat Sun Shong, who you're going to meet here in a second. And uh, we just, uh, when I went to his office, I spent a little bit of time with him, and then we decided to go to dinner afterward. And we had dinner, and he pulled out literally a, a napkin and started writing out his entire approach to how he thought we could maybe one day see the end of cancer. And uh, as journalists, we tend to be pretty skeptical of things, suspicious. Uh, we ask a lot of questions, and it was no different here. But by the end of that dinner, I realized that um, I was possibly sitting with somebody who was going to truly revolutionize the way that we at least looked at cancer, perhaps approached cancer, and maybe even did what he said he wanted to do was uh, see the end of cancer. Exactly how he was going to do it was different than some of the strategies I'd heard before and we decided to, to go ahead and put this 60 Minutes piece together uh, that featured some of those technologies. He's a, he's a pretty remarkable guy. He has many different facets to his personality. I'm going to be interviewing him along with uh, uh, CEO of BlackBerry, John Chen. Uh, we've got a lot of questions for the two of them. You're going to understand the interplay uh, of why these two gentlemen are together here in a second. And we're also going to talk to, to John Chen about uh, some breaking news that just happened regarding the FCC approving net neutrality. Uh, what that means exactly for all of us and for him. Uh, we're going to talk about that, define it, and, uh, and learn a lot more. So please help me welcome as a starting point Dr. Pat Sun Shong. Well, this is familiar. <laughs> I know. We spent about 18 before. months together doing, doing interviews, and you got a chance to watch the, the entire piece, and it was tough to encapsulate uh, all the work that you're, you're, you're doing. But what, what, what did you think of that piece? Well, first of all, it's amazing how you could take, I said, what, almost 18 months, two years worth of work together and put it into 15 minutes. And <laughs> <laughs> but it was amazing. You did a fantastic job. It's, and this is a difficult subject. And hopefully, you know, when we started, we said there's basically eight chapters that I need to go through. And over a decade ago, I started chapter one, and we, I think we're into chapter six. And I said to you today, I'll show you today for the first time chapter seven. Right. So before you get to chapter eight. But it, is a, it was a wonderful piece that you did, and thank you. 
Thank you. The, the, uh, for, for people who don't know some of the background here, one of the things that uh, Dr. Pat uh, told me early on was that there would be value in basically sequencing completely and analyzing every tumor genome of every patient, really uh, ultimately anywhere in the world. That it was important to look at the entire genome of a cancer patient at the time they were diagnosed, which meant sequencing the genome and then analyzing that genome for all the various mutations. As a starting point, to tell us why, why is that important? Right now, you might look for certain mutations. If someone has breast cancer, you might look for BRCA1, BRCA2, breast cancer1, breast cancer2 mutations. What is the value of, of doing the whole thing? Well, maybe the way to put it into perspective, um, the nematode, the worm, has 20,000 genes. You and I, as human beings, have 20,000 genes. There has to be some difference between the worm and you and I, and the difference, frankly, is the complexity of this whole genome that controls these genes that make downstream the proteins that actually make you and I work. So in order for us to know how to treat you, what's causing the disease, you need to not only measure the entire genome, which happens to be three billion base pairs. So when unraveled, that's about six feet in length. The 20,000 genes that's within that is one inch that makes all the proteins. What we're doing today in the United States, we're measuring 500 genes is 0.1 inch. It's one one thousandth of the knowledge that actually you need as a physician to treat. And I saw that as a major flaw in any understanding of what to do. So not only do you have to measure, unfortunately, these whole genome, you need to measure the 20,000 genes, and then unfortunately you beget another problem, because now you find when we do that, there's 10,000 mutations that we find. What's scary, we find that as you're sitting here, all of you, there'll be mutations, thousands of mutations that's happening every day in your body, that's actually being constantly repaired, uh, and these mutations are being constantly repaired as a normal mechanism. So then the next question is, if you have a patient with cancer, these 10,000 mutations, which ones are important? And the only way to know that is which of these mutations go downstream, which we call transcribe or translate into proteins, which means you need to measure the next thing, not DNA, but RNA, which is another 200,000, and then tie that to the 2 million proteins to get to the proteomics. So this challenge is actually whole genomes, all DNA, all RNA to get to the proteomics so we understand which protein is affected so we know what drug to give. So if ever you've seen the matrix, are you the one? Uh, that's what you're trying to find. And I've likened this to this concept of God's particle. God's particle is this universe of colliding atoms. But in your body, you have these colliding atoms, which is these proteins, but they're happening all the time. So the computer mathematical challenge is to find the God's particle in your human body in real time. And if we can find that, we then found the molecular signature which is causing that cancer to grow and go and find a way to actually stop that particular molecular signature. And that's why this is important. That's, uh, that's pretty well put. Does everyone get that? <laughs> yeah. Six billion pieces of genetic material arranged in three billion base pairs, which encode for 20,000 genes, which are then transcribed into RNA, then subsequently into proteins. It's those proteins, the proteomics, that ultimately is, could potentially be the one, could be the thing that's the, the genesis of a cancer in an individual. It's, it's, it's really remarkable, and I think it's important, all kidding aside, one of the analogies Dr. Pat had given me once is just simply to analyze the genome you could imagine having a planet Earth over here with three billion homes on it. It's, 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 it's orbiting, you have all these homes you're looking at, that's the normal genome. Over here you have a patient's genome also orbiting with three billion homes on it. The only difference between these two planets is a single home on a small street in Hong Kong that used to be red is now green. You gotta find that. Or that same home that was once on the small street in Hong Kong is now in Taipei. That's called the translocation. In order to do that sort of analysis, give us some context. How hard is it to do? How much time did it used to take? How much time does it take now? 
It takes, and still today, most people 10 to 12 weeks having manually looking at these algorithms in a very difficult way because you need to compare, as you said, 3 billion letters in real time to another 3 billion of normal letters. But that's then the problem. If it takes you 10 weeks, 4 weeks, 6 weeks, every patient is seen by a doctor, gets a chemotherapy, and then comes back in another three weeks. Another scary thought we've discovered is that the treatment that you give as a physician actually affects the genome as you're treating the patient, which means you need to repeat. We have 13 million cancer patient survivors in the United States, 2 million new diagnoses. You do the math, 10,000 patients a day. How could we afford to wait 11 weeks on one patient's analysis? So we needed to devise and build a supercomputer, what we call machine learning tool, that can actually manage this kind of data and do this analysis, and we can now do up to 4,000 patients a day. 4,000 patients a day. I mean, and that, that changes the entire equation. It makes this sort of information, this knowledge, relevant to patients. It, it makes it actionable. And the reason it makes it actionable is because if we can not only do that whole genome sequencing, but take it to the next level, as I said, the RNA sequencing and the proteomics, you can then identify this dance of proteins that's happening. And what's exciting is that your human body sitting here, as we're sitting here, is being protected by a cell called the natural killer cell. That natural killer cell is innately on all the time waiting for viruses, waiting for bacteria, and waiting for these abnormal antigens to be expressed on these abnormal cells that's happening in your body and killing it. But the problem is, how do you know in a cancer cell that has multiple different proteins, what is the address? Therefore, what antibody to actually give if you want to give that? So the opportunity now is, I heard this this morning, I think it's a great analogy, is to be the uber of healthcare, but at the molecular level to know the molecular address of the cancer cell in every human being, find a driver, i.e. a missile and target to target that, and put inside there what we call an NK or a tank with cluster bombs to kill that cancer cell. That is the reality today. Um, we will show that you that. Um, and if I may, Sanjay, I'll yeah, let's get a few uh, videos or slides to actually show, show that. that. Yeah, show that video. One thing I'll just say again, so you're, right now we all have cancer cells in, in our body. Um, Dr. Oz had mentioned that earlier, you just mentioned that again. There's a constant battle that's being waged in our body at any given time between the cancer cells that are developing and the immune cells which are subsequently fighting those cancer cells. Right? Correct. It's, it turns out that uh, uh, biology is actually universal in a sense. There's some universal switch here that says the, the genetics that actually make you as a human being that actually make stem cells or the genetics that's getting involved in inflammation, or the genetics that's involved in creating a cancer stem cell, are flip sides of the same coin. So we are, at all times, being inundated by exposures that somehow take these genetics that are supposed to make a stem cell go a little off, and you have a little cancer cell, but your body deals with it, you don't even know it, because of the natural killer cell. What happens, however, as the cancer cell really grows, your natural killer cells have two kinds of receptors, those that are asleep and those that are awake, called silencing, and those are activated. It has to, otherwise you will be killing all your normal cells and have, in fact, autoimmune disease. So the cancer cell gets real smart and shuts off the natural killer cell by activating these inhibitory cells. So your natural killer cell all of a sudden is asleep and doesn't recognize the cancer cell. So that is the... That is the uh, opportunity now is to find a natural killer cell that we can actually grow on the shelf that is completely activated all the time, could not be put asleep, and targeted to your tumor. But what do we find? How do we find the target? Now you full circle, you need to find the protein of that tumor. Now you full circle, you need to do the whole genome RNA proteomics and have it in time so we can give it to the patient. I'm struggling right now um, in the country I just gave the presidential address to the American uh, AMA because if you think about it, there's one element in the country right now, a big rage of immunotherapy, a thing called CAR T cells, and that's a right, right rage, by the way, in which they're trying to stimulate your immune system to kill cancer. Yet, how do you marry that with this current 99% of cancer doctors today 
uh, giving patients chemotherapy to wipe out the, the immune system. How do you marry that logic? You can't, which means that's the reason why we've lost the war against cancer. We've come down the wrong path, thinking that there's a single clone in cancer, so we would nuke it with drugs at the maximum tolerated dose. It's a, it's a term of medical art. Think about what maximum tolerated dose means. It means giving you just enough drug that doesn't kill you um, with the idea that it would kill this one single clone, wipe out your immune system, then we'll give you a neupogen and epigen, and we'll give you drugs that will bring back your immune system, hopefully. And when it doesn't work, you have metastasis, and oops, now you're into hospice. And we think we've taken this for 40 years. Yet the other country thought, which is now actually the science and the truth, that cancer is made up of thousands of clones, mm. thousands. So hitting it with one drug is useless. It's futile, in fact, harmful. So you need to have a multitude of drugs at the lowest dose, preserve the immune system, and activate the immune system. A whole new paradigm of care, uh, which means that you require, in order to know which uh, immune system to target, you need to do your genomics and proteomics. So there's a lot of information here that none of us have been educated on. I am a, um, a cancer surgeon. Uh, I have to go back, frankly, to actually see patients now so that we can actually um, institute this in the nation. So that's the sort of scary thought and, and you know, having uh, presentations not only like this but on the 60 Minutes is, is an opportunity for us now to really bring this information out. One of the things, uh, one of the themes to today and throughout this conference is engaging the patient slash human slash consumer, anybody who wants to have more knowledge literally in the palm of their hands. And that's one of the things that you talked about that you unveiled with us as well on the program, to be able to, to give people their genome, their, their sequence and their analysis literally in the palm of their hands. And, and before you start talking about that, I think this is a great opportunity to, to bring out the CEO of BlackBerry. Uh, John Shen, please welcome him. Thank you. Okay, how are you? I'm going to have you uh, show us this. Uh, you both have your your oh, device. passports with you, but and 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 you have a genome loaded up, and we're going to show that to you in a second. But first of all, let me just ask about how, how did this this partnership happen? How did you guys meet, John? Well, um, I joined um, BlackBerry about 15 months ago. Um, um, and um, it's kind of gratifying to see some of you have, still have the BlackBerry O device. <laughs> I got it. Thank you. I'd I, I like to show you a new one. That, uh, um, but Which is called No, no, I only have two on my, I mean, on me. I, I, don't, I don't have a phone in every pocket, uh, although I'm a phone salesman. But. So, um, you, know, one of the, you know, when I came to the company, we, you know, I was trying to take stock of what is the strength of the company. Uh, and so uh, I hope everybody will agree that security and privacy protection has been kind of the number one um, know-how of the company. Um, government uses it, um, kind of banks and, and everywhere use it. So I thought one of the strategy that um, I should do is to build on that piece of assets. And so when you look at that, you start homing into the market. The market is regulated industry, which way we could add value. It's not. It's not about convincing my 16-year-old daughter that she, could, she should use something more secure, more private. She put everything on Facebook anyway, so there's nothing secure and private about anything. So I thought, let, let's do something that is professionally required. Um, so it's very easy to get to the point of medical field is a big, is a big uh, opportunity. On top of that, I would have bet, uh, most of you, I know a lot of you, um, runs hospital clinical operations. Um, you probably are still using a lot of old equipment like window 2000s. Um, you know, so the last time you all have upgraded uh, your technology infrastructure, probably the year 2000, um, when you were at least addressing that issue. Um, I, I could be wrong, so, um, but at least our research has shown that. Um, so that's how we were looking for um, application that could really take advantage of all our infrastructure, not only the phone. The phone is just a very small piece. Patrick and I have created kind of an architecture that is much broader than that. 
for everything he built. And he builds a lot of stuff. <laughs> everything he built runs on our server system that interact with our NOx systems. And these are all webbage. But what it does is every layer, it's like layers and layers of locks and encryption. Um, and then that goes to his supercomputer network. So you can see that we're marrying kind of the security and power together and to solve a lot of the medical problems. I know nothing about medicine, uh, only to play golf with my doctor. <laughs> that way he will return my phone call uh, when I call him up. That's, you, know, you guys being doctors, you understand, oh, sure. right? Uh, but anyway, um, so it's been a great partnership. Um, and we built a genomics browser to display um, a lot of the stuff that Patrick research team has been working on. Um, and and, and they, they obviously could make sense of the data, I couldn't. Um, but we built a very secure environment both on the voice part as well as the data part. So you could have a, have a very secure conferencing among um, the doctor groups, the specialist, uh, or doctor patients conversations. Um, use this as, use the dev particular device as a uh, video conference hub, for example. So all these things are being built in. Um, the technology we're going to add to it, um, from a security of the voice part, is the technology that Chancellor Merkel of Germany uses after he found out, she found out somebody by the name of Snowden. Um, so that company we recently bought. Uh, sure. in Germany, so those like, technology will import in that, so nobody's going to be eavesdrop in the patient-doctor conversations. Uh, it takes about 100 and some years to crack, um, so by that time, the conversation is useless. So. <laughs> I'm going to ask you in a second, John, if you can quantify how much more secure it is. You talked about some of the strategies, but before we do that, Pat Patrick, do you want to show, so if I, if I was a patient of yours and I had been diagnosed and had a biopsy, and had a sample taken for genomic sequencing and analysis, and that, that, I, that would just go and be tested somewhere, what, 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 what could I possibly see next <coughs> if I had the smartphone? Right. So, you know, I think there's two things. We have a challenge in which we need to educate the current oncologists, because none of us have been trained in molecular medicine. So the first thing is this is in the hands of the physician as well as in the hands of the patient. So one of the goals is we really is to create patient empowerment. And you may, if you remember the days of HIV, where these patients were completely knowledgeable about the disease. And in cancer, it's going to be the same. So this will then appear, uh, the person's genome will appear, and all the details about the abnormalities will appear t in the hands of the doctor. I, it's not shown up there, Sanjay, but, and then you could, you could find the, uh, the abnormality and there's three billion base pairs, and literally hit the abnormality, and it goes all the way to the cloud, to the supercomputer, brought right down to the device, uh, to that actual base pair. The doctor and the patient, it's like a molecular MRI, the best way to think about it. You and your doctor are sharing this MRI image. It makes no sense to the patient what you're looking at. The doctor points out, well, here's the mass, well, here's the abnormality, and now here's the abnormality, and here are the drugs, and this is why we're gonna give you this drug because this molecular target and this, and this uh, drug actually marries each other. So I think this is going to be the way of the future where instead of thinking of disease at the organ level, you're gonna think of the disease at the cellular level and that cell is completely independent of any anatomy. So it means a drug for breast cancer could be used for drug in lung cancer, a drug for pancreatic cancer could be used for drug for brain tumors and in fact that's what we're finding. Cancer has no knowledge of which organ it's at. It's only it's a molecular profile of what it's doing. So this is what will be brought to bear. So you, you get to see your, your sequencing, your analysis, possibly trials that are going on that might be of benefit to you for that particular mutational abnormality. Correct. I, I, again, I think this bears repeating. When, when, when you think about this the way that Patrick's describing it, you no longer think of cancers being denoted by anatomical location. You wouldn't call something a breast cancer or a pancreatic cancer anymore. The idea that you could find a breast cancer mutation in a cervical cancer, right? So a person that might have cervical cancer uh, it does not have many good options. They've been tested for known cervical cancer mutations, found none, and they would never know to even look for potential breast cancer mutations. But if you sequence the entire thing, you potentially find a breast cancer mutation and possibly a existing treatment. That's in fact... Sanjay's relating 
actually a real life story. So we had a patient uh, who we got a call on and the family members were saying goodbye to her. She had third line, third line chemotherapy, happened to have done a whole genome sequence. She said, please send it to us. We discovered a virus, a papilloma virus, inserted into the genome. This was the first clinical discovery ever of a virus at the molecular level inserted into the genome, which actually caused an overexpression of a receptor called OB2, which is treatable by Herceptin. We called the doctor and said, she probably has cervical cancer. And he said, how do you know that? Well, she has this virus, and she should be on Herceptin, which is a breast cancer drug. They had to tell the insurance company she had breast cancer in order to get the drug approved to her. She got the drug, and she had complete recovery. Went on a cruise for a year. We had a similar thing, a brain tumor, um, just four months ago, a young boy, 17 years old, brain tumor removed. Unfortunately, the brain tumor residual. Uh, they were going to radiate, didn't know what to do. We said, well, let's do the whole genome sequence. She had one red gene which caused a deletion and treatable by Gleevec. So here is where you begin to see real-world changes happening based on knowledge that was never available to us as physicians before. John, this is some of the most intimate um, knowledge about any individual that exists. It's your, it's your genome. It's the essence of who you are. You want it to be secure. Uh, you don't want it to... It's going to be streamed from a supercomputer to my phone in some way. What, what kind of confidence, what kind of guarantees can BlackBerry make that that's going to be secure? Well, I, you know, this is one of those things. Um, you know, cyber attack, um, you know, viruses, insertion, different type of viruses. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, you can never, you know, I, I will be less than truthful to sit here and tell you we got it all. I mean, that's ridiculous. Um, this is the cat and mouse game. Um, all, we, all we could do is to make more combination and encryption and decryption technology. We, we, we put all the data scramble, data arrest protections. You know, um, it, you know there was a ma major insurance company just recently got hacked in. Um, we, we try to understand, uh, so what happened? You know, what, what could we do? Turns out there has been things that could have been done. Um, you know, the, you know, security and virus protection and, and cyber protection is always like the following. It's like um, you know, you, you always think it's not going to happen to you, uh, and 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 more and more companies out there are are being hacked. And so, so as a result, so the only thing I could promise is that we put tons of research. Um, investment, you know, buying up, you know, technology company to integrate security and, and privacy protections into our technology. And we think about it holistically. We don't think about it, oh, this is the phone. The phone is more secure. I mean, I, I, I always got, you know, um, kind of baited in to have those kind of conversation. Is your phone more secure than iPhone? Well, the only thing I could promise you is with our way of going through our interaction of our operating center, um, if you take a nude picture of yourself, most likely it will not be appearing on the internet. Now, why you want to take a nude picture of yourself, I don't know. Uh, I'm still trying to figure that one out. Um, I, I just, you know, I, I, can't, I can't give you a lot of names, so I'm sorry. I've got to be circling this. But anyway, um, so those are fun facts. Um, um, so, so the only thing I could say is we look at it holistically. We make a lot of investment. It's like, it's like locking your door, your front door, your side door, protecting your home, and that's what you do. And that's what we do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, open up to audience questions in a minute. I, I want to get back to... Uh, Let me just do a bit yeah, security thing which we, we are working yeah. on. And you know, we'll sort of tease, this, tease it a little bit, <coughs> not really reveal it yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good tease right there. <laughs> so we've built a semiconductor chip that can move data at 6,000 megabits a second and put it in the form factor of this card. So this card is live. And it could house then your human genome, your x-rays, your CAT scans, your medical information, your movies, um, and be almost a credit card and completely unhackable from a sense that the code will be your three billion letters completely scrambled and tied to a device that will actually be able to uh, reveal the x-ray and the CAT scan um, in real time. So this is one of the ways you have what we call cloud in your pocket and have 
some level of security that interacts with the BlackBerry. And I think we're doing a little bit of show and tell at Mobile World Congress uh, next week or something. So That's when you'll actually reveal it? No, not fully. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, you be, this is the beginnings of where you really need Best way to think about it, this is NFC on steroids. Um, so, you know, and people can snoop by still through the wave layer, through the airwaves, but by doing this and, and having this move at 6,000 megabits a second, it's very almost impossible to snoop the data of this thing. So, so that's going to have to be really, I think, the ultimate form of security, uh, as close as you can get at least. As we, uh, we, we can take questions here in a second. Let, let, me, let me just use that as a jumping point, though, to ask about the, just the sheer amount of, of data and how quickly it can move from point A to point B. You just heard, John, just, just literally before our panel, the FCC okayed uh, net neutrality. Uh, you can, I, I'd like you to define that a little bit for us and then also give us some idea of the speeds, Patrick, at which this data can move from point A to point B. Let's talk about net neutrality first. Well, net neutrality, <laughs> um, I, um, not, uh, 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 most recently I, bought, I wrote a blog that was most unwise. Um, <laughs> uh, it got a lot of response, and some of them are pretty negative. Uh, uh, net neutrality, I mean, it is, a, is a big subject, but at, a, at, a, at the base, base principle of it is everybody in our country should have the ability to get onto the internet at equal amount of speed. I mean, that, that's the availability issues. Um, you know, so if you translate that, it's like utilities. I mean, everybody could turn on the lights and get electricity and, and all that. The problem with ut utilities uh, as a model, um, which the government you know, is pushing, or the current government is pushing, um, is that it tends to fix this fixed price. And that, I think, stifle creativity, stifle invention, stifle growth. Personally, I feel that way. Um, and I think that aligned with the phone companies. So, so the, make, the major media uh, and company as well as the telephone, the so-called, the old, old our box, are all aligned to that. Now, the details, whether they are fixing the price or not, we don't know. I think the first draft says no. But government unfortunately, has a way to, once they're in to regulating, it will evolve. I mean, I mean you, you guys all know that, right? We, we, the healthcare industry is not going through it in a very profound way. So, so we're, we're a little scared of that. Um, so that's that. Now, what I further said is, well, if you regulate the availability of anybody could get on the highway, you need to start assuring that every car should get on the, on the same highway. So I went into the apps neutrality, which have gotten a lot of negative feedbacks on a lot of people. Um, and people thought that because uh, BlackBerry doesn't have enough you know, apps, like you know, a lot of games and so forth. Yeah, you know, it's true, we don't, do, we don't do Angry Birds very well, I, I admit. Um, it was not a priority to get Angry Birds on Angry Birds 3. Oh, by the way, those are developed in China, so if you guys will <laughs> worry about uh, whatever. Uh, uh, so uh, you might be playing Angry Birds. They might be listening to what you're saying uh, at the same time. I don't, I don't know that. But Samsung TV apparently could hear what you say while you're watching the movie. Um, uh, uh, Is this on the record? Oh, by the way, uh, that, that's maybe, maybe, maybe off the record. Okay, so anyway, I, I try to digress. Uh, I, I didn't intend to digress. But, uh, <laughs> Um, so, but, but I really believe that, you know, application availability to everybody is good. It's not really about BlackBerry, uh, because I'm focusing on different classes of applications to start out with. Also, um, you know, you may or may not know that, that BlackBerry also run on the Android code. So it's not about application availability. But anyway, so that was the net neutrality uh, debate. The, the, the industry, when they sell the spectrum, I believe, um, you know, 20, 30 years ago, then when there was a spectrum sold to Verizon, there was an agreement entered with the government and the regional uh, phone company or the, or the carriers that actually work, has been working very well without the um, control of pricing. And again, I mean, my concern, like everybody concerned in industry, that we, the government went one step further to start controlling pricing. 
the details yet to be known because it just happened this morning. Right, it's just, I mean, literally, this is a real time now. Yeah. How quickly can data move, uh, Patrick? From well, I mean, you, gave, you gave some great analogies, I remember, yeah. uh, with so, Netflix, so Google. So just to do 10,000 patients a day of genomics is equivalent to 30 times the download of Facebook per day. That's what we're talking about. As we take one human patient, that's half a terabyte, so we do 10,000 patients a day, you, you end up into an impossible situation where how do you actually manage the world with this kind of data? So we have built um, almost like a health intranet uh, and created a streamer from the sequencing machine that can now move data at um, eight terabytes a second. So which then can move this across the world um, through the United States into the Europe, into Japan. And that's one of the reasons why we need to participate with the BES system because we can create this an opportunity to create a cloud, a very secure cloud. One of the opportunities, frankly, is to capture what we call the human signal engine. Uh, you heard this morning about the ability to monitor a person's self. And I believe that at the end of the day, your vital signs, heart rate, blood pressure, can, uh, could all be monitored through the internet of things, the internet of medical things. So we've developed wireless scales, blood pressure machines, um, pulse oximeters, and let it talk from analog directly to a box securely and then sent up to the cloud without the patient doing any input. We're now capturing three billion vital signs in 250 hospitals in this way and will extend it into the home. So, you know, the internet is going to be very important. Fiber transport, cybersecurity is going to be very important. And this is part of the things we're working on. Eight terabytes per second. Just uh, that's the. Let's take some. Let's take some questions. I, I, it's a little bit hard for me to see. Do we have a? Maybe got a question. Let's see. Let's just identify yourself. Uh, Why not make the endpoint a uh, commodity at this point? Because if you can have a secure window into this great infrastructure and you have the bandwidth that you're building, then that makes it much more ubiquitous than tying it at the end of the day to one platform. Is that part of the strategy ultimately to reach everyone? Yeah, um, so the current part of, well, I, I could only talk about the stuff that I'm, I'm working on. Um, the, um, first of all, uh, the next move that we're building is so-called the IOMT, um, you know, the Internet of Medical Things. Um, so we're already in a lot of the heart pump scanner, I mean, um, our operating systems um, uh, into X-ray machine scanners, you know, in a, a lot of the GE equipments, medical equipments, and so forth. And they're streaming at high speed data. So today is go through usually wired connections, um, and we're trying to upgrade it to wireless connections. Um, and then that, of course, have to tie to Every part of that particular food chain all have to be about, have to have the same ability to receive the data uh, like this, uh, uh, like this. I thought it was a perfectly cute. Uh, to that. Um, and um, so, and storing the data, so and, and making it secure. So we're working that. Eventually, um, we will open that software to a lot of other devices, um, and but that is going to be a later stage one because we need to make sure that it works on our source. And so that, that's where we are. But yeah, that so, is a good so this will be ultimately be an endpoint, and the ubiquitous endpoint is the way we sort of see it. Um, I don't know if it's useful for me to sort of talk a little bit yeah, about. Yeah, let's just do that. So let me, let me just take two, two minutes, sort of three minutes, four minutes, if I can do this in four minutes. Um, really, the, the, the issues that we're facing, um, that, um, and this is a challenge that we now need to rethink. We've always thought that cancer was a single clone for 40 years, and that's why we've nuked the, nuked the cell, nuked the tumor, wiped out the immune system. Yet it's hundreds of thousands of clones. So if you, if you and this is an unfortunate patient with melanoma. So here's a drug that's been built called BRAF, which is a targeted therapy. And this targeted therapy is given to this patient and this miraculous treatment. So here is, if in fact this was a single clone, then we'd have cured cancer. Unfortunately, within nine weeks, this is what happens because the clones now awaken. So it's taken nine years to develop the drug, and all of pharma industry is going down this path. 
and nine weeks to relapse. And this is a scary thought, that resistance is therefore fait accompli. The time to recur is simply the interval required for the subclone to repopulate the lesion. And you look at that sobering um, statement there and says, therefore, giving a single drug in maximum tolerable dose is such a futile attempt. Your only course is the immune system. And this is what today I want to introduce this thing called the natural killer cell. What you're seeing there is a real T cell, actually, which is, acts like a natural killer cell. What you see there is a cancer cell. And there's this thing called the immune synapse, which is this dance of proteins. So this cancer cell actually secretes multiple proteins, and that's its trick. It sometimes secretes proteins to turn off that cell, but if it doesn't turn off that cell, it gets killed. I want to show you this video of... Uh, can I play this video? Am I... Oh, so well, they're not going to show me the video. Um, Anyway, we'll get you another video then. <laughs> so that, I was trying to show you the T-cell on patrol. And Phil, maybe if you can pull that video back up, it would be great. So these are T-cells. These are real T-cells. Amazing video uh, of actual T-cells done by, by a person in Cambridge. Um, and um, these T-cells is what patrol your body today. So these are the T cells patrolling your body. And when it actually sees a cancer cell, and that's a cancer cell and a T cell, you have this explosion of interaction. That's what we call the immune synapse. Like a neural synapse, but it's activating. What is then happening is that this T cell has these red cluster bombs. And it actually penetrates what they call perforin, perforates the cancer cell. And that's a real cancer cell being penetrated now by this T cell. And that cancer cell is now folding with those cluster bombs and dying. So this is our opportunity. This is really our opportunity really to transform cancer treatment into immune therapy. The, unfortunately, this T cells or CAR T cells, and I'm sure you're going to have a, a presentation in the next 30 minutes that says this is going to cost $100,000, $300,000, and every patient becomes a stem cell transplant which then says the next cell that's in your body is this natural killer cell. So imagine if you could take the natural killer cell, make sure it doesn't go asleep, and target it to a protein. So that red cell there is a HER2 positive cancer cell. Those green are breast cells. And if I could play the first video of that, targeted killer cell, it's just, and it's seeking it out. And this just got published last week. This is about to go into phase one trials, phase two trials, and it, it's even in glioblastoma that express. The next you'll see is this what I call car tank, same cell, being a serial killer. And if I can play that, you guys are playing it. Technical difficulties. We can figure out how to sequence. There it the goes. App, yeah. And it's actually literally going and doing a serial killing. So that's our savior here. This is what I call the path to the cure. Give yourself time. Identify the protein signature. Give multiple doses at the lowest dose. Resurrect your immune system and then supplant your immune system with these car tank cells. And that was put us. So we were in chapter seven. I just showed you chapter seven. <laughs> and um, how many chapters are there? <laughs> you know, thank you. We, we, we've gone a little bit over already. I know there's probably more questions. I'm sure uh, John Chen and Pat Soon Sean will be around to answer them. But uh, please thank them warmly. Thank you. Always fun. <laughs> Always fun. Thank you. Thank you.